1984, Frank Hyman was a delegate to the South Carolina State Democratic Convention and helped deliver his state to Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign. Not long after that, he moved to Durham, he says, because the summers are cooler here. <laughs> <laughs> Frank never wanted a career. Instead, he makes his living from the nine professions he's mastered. Stone masonry, carpentry, horticulture, design, photography, sculpture, foraging, politics, and writing. He's held two local elected offices, conservation district supervisor, and Durham City Council member, where he authored the first living wage ordinance in the South. His ancestors, his ancestors served in the Confederate States Army, and his essay, The Confederacy Was a Con Job on White People and Still Is, has appeared in two dozen large newspapers. He's also a policy analyst for Blue Collar Comeback, which is the name of the website where you'll find links to that and his other essays that have appeared in print. Today, he's addressing how the Electoral College has been a powerful white supremacist tool and that like a Confederate monument, it can and should be torn down. And we can do it without a constitutional amendment. Mr. Frank Hyman. Thank you, everybody. So in 2016, we had an election, and Hillary Clinton won by three million votes and was duly sworn in as our first woman president. Her first act was to renominate the guy that Obama had nominated for the Supreme Court. The Senate, of course, had to uh, uh, OK him. And now we have a liberal Supreme Court. And some people are shaking their heads. Is something wrong? That's not what happened? What, ha what did happen? I thought that's what happened. Because she won, right? So what happened? What did I get wrong? The Electoral College? What did the Electoral College do? So who's the president? The guy that lost? Is the president? Wow, I guess I got that wrong, huh? And so, well, that explains something, because I saw an article, and I thought it must have been a satirical article, like in The Onion or on uh, you know, uh, one of those shows, um, where they said that uh, one of the segregationist Jesse Helms' protégés, Thomas Farr, was going to be appointed to a lifetime seat on, uh, as a judge. And I thought that was, like, satirical. But you're saying that's Trump really is the president and did it. Okay, maybe I got some other things wrong. So, okay, help, hopefully I didn't get this right. So 2008 and 2012, Obama did get the most votes, right? And became president. Okay, so that's good. Well, 2000, Al Gore won by 500,000 votes, and he became president, right? And appointed two liberals to the Supreme Court? No? What, did, well, what, what have I got wrong? Electoral College. So the guy that lost, George... Something, Bush, became the president, even though he lost? So, okay, so I guess the article, the, the other article I read wasn't a satirical one either. So he did appoint two people, conservatives, to the Supreme Court, which gave them the vote so they could gut the Voting Rights Act and overturn Citizens United. So that wasn't, okay, so that was true. That wasn't, I thought that was satirical. Wow, okay, well there's, another, well, there's another election I have a question about. Maybe I've got it wrong, too. So 1876, most of y'all probably weren't here. <laughs> so 1876, a Democrat, Southern Democrat, named Tilden, got the most votes, and he became president, right? And he wanted to overturn Reconstruction, which under Ulysses S. Grant had crushed the first iteration of the Ku Klux Klan and helped... Uh, African Americans become elected officials and economic leaders. And so even though the Democrat who got the most votes wanted to overturn Reconstruction, it was a Republican Congress, so they would not have gone along with that, right? But you're looking at me like you think something else happened. Did something different happen than that? Reconstruction went on for decades after that election, right? No. No? What happened? Did, what did I get wrong? A deal? What kind of deal? 
Somebody must have been here then that, who said that. What was the deal? What was the, what was, uh, what was the deal? The Republicans gave up reconstruction so they could win the office of president. Rutherford B. Hayes was elected. Oh, that explains that then. Yes, that's what I got wrong. So you're saying that even though the Democrat, Tilden, got the most popular votes, the Republicans really wanted their guy to be in the White House, so they were willing to give up on Reconstruction, sell out the black people. So they ended Reconstruction so that 20 electoral votes would go to Rutherford B. Hayes, who came in second in the popular vote, and he became president. So that probably wasn't too good for black people then, was it? Okay, well, let's go back. There's another race that I'm thinking I've got something wrong there, too. So 1800, there were probably even fewer of y'all were here then. <laughs> and so the slaveholder Thomas Jefferson ran against the incumbent John Adams, who was not a big rah-rah abolitionist, but he was pro-abolition. And he was the incumbent president, and he got the most popular vote. So he won re-election, and Thomas Jefferson went away, right? <laughs> And as the abolitionist president, he was able to set in motion some things that made it better for black folks and white folks, right? Yeah. No, that didn't happen either. Oh, uh, well, that explains something I read because, I mean, John Adams did get the most votes, but Thomas Jefferson became the president in 1800 because he had 12 more electoral college votes. And the electoral college was a little different then, if I'm remembering right, because in the southern states, let me back up, in the northern states, the free states, their electoral college votes only depended on the number of, you know, white guys who could vote, right? But in the southern states, the white guys who could vote counted towards the electoral college delegates, but also black people counted out of three-fifths, three-fifths of them counted, like a 40% discount on black people. They couldn't vote, but they were going to be counted as numbers that bumped up the electoral college delegates for southern slaveholding states. So that John Adams could have more voters, which were only white guys over 21, right? But still. He had more voters, but Thomas Jefferson shows up with 12 more electoral college delegates because he had 19 of his total delegates essentially represented, uh, it's kind of the wrong word, but I'll think of something else, but were representative of the three-fifths of the black people in the South, right? So I got a few of those things wrong, but we, we're kind of on track now, right? And, and you really didn't need me to tell you all that because that was like a major part of your high school history. <laughs> education, right? And in college, when you studied American history, they, they, this was like worth at least three weeks to go on about the Electoral College and how it was set up so that uh, southern states would have more uh, force and that in multiple elections, it really skewed things to the, uh, in a way that harmed black people directly and working white people less directly. So your, your college history classes really emphasize that, right? And you didn't need to hear me say that, right? So, but I guess not, huh? Did anybody learn any of those things in college history or high school history? Okay, so here's where I get to say, okay, one, one, somebody was awake during history, during the day they mentioned that. But, um, so here's one of my general themes in this and other talks is that uh, our history teachers and our history professors really ought to have done a better job. I'm not saying they're bad people. They really should have been doing a better job with this, especially given that we just finished celebrating the uh, sesqu I, 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 and this word is so sesquicentennial. Who knows what that means? 150 years, the 150th, right? Yeah, anniversary of, like, anniversary of the Civil War, like we're celebrating. And none of this like came out, right? Nothing about 1876 and the loss of Reconstruction because of the Electoral College, none of that happened, right? So, uh, 
So where do we go with that? Let me, um, there's kind of three things I want to accomplish today. One is to help you know a little bit more about the Electoral College, and we've got to start on that. Uh, the other one is to help you understand how we can dismantle it without having to go through the rigmarole of a constitutional amendment. Uh, one of the other things I want to do, and this is kind of a general theme in all my talks, especially if it's around politics, is to remind people to turn off their cell phones. That's the third thing. <laughs> so the fourth thing that I try to get across is things you can do or learn to do that make you a more effective citizen, a more effective activist. Would that be worthwhile? Yeah. Should I mention some of those things as we go along? Okay, so I'm going to um, dive into one of those right now, which I'm going to uh, read you an essay I wrote that uh, a variation of this ran in the uh, Richmond paper, the capital of the old confederacy. I love that. And most recently, another version, a very different version of it, tackling the same topic, ran in the Herald Sun. And uh, the reason I'm going to read this to you is th this is uh, a lot of the, not all the active activism I do now, but some of it. And I know there's a number of you here who have either written letters to the editor or maybe you've written op-eds, which an op-ed means an opinion piece in the newspaper, and maybe some have been published, maybe some of you have written something and it hasn't been published and you're frustrated about that, or maybe some of you would like to do that, or you'd like to be able to just write something for your group just for internal consumption and have it be persuasive and passed around and effective, and I'm gonna share a few things with you that show you how to do that. And part of what I'm going to share is, by reading this out loud, this is how I write. It's a mis I think it's a big mistake in the teaching of writing to think that, the, that writing is about the paper. Think for a moment, well, like when you're reading a novel, or you're reading the newspaper, what's happening? It isn't, the, the, this isn't changing. What's happening is that there's a voice in your head, right? And good writing is happening when that voice in your head is moving along smoothly and it's like you're sitting down with a good, smart friend who's sharing some information with you and you are like hooked. You want to hear the next thing they say. And so when writing sounds like that voice of that kind, intelligent friend, people will read it. They'll put aside, you know, the YouTubes and things and they'll read your work. And so when I draft a piece, I print it out, I get up, I walk around, I read it out loud to myself. And every sentence or phrasing that sounds wrong, sounds wrong to my ear. And I change it, and then I go back and redo it until it sounds smooth. So tell me if this sounds the way something persuasive, you would like something persuasive that you write to sound, okay? So the title of this, and again, it ran in the Herald Sun a few weeks ago. Uh, the title is, Let's Tear Down the Worst Slavery Era Monument the Electoral College. Two of our last three presidents lost the popular vote, yet we're going to be living with their judges, laws, and executive orders for a long time. That doesn't happen in any other democratic country. Doesn't happen. When George W. Bush lost the popular vote but won the 2000 election, my heart turned to ash that our country would award its highest office to the loser just seemed wrong. We couldn't allow this to happen again. To a number of friends, I argued we needed to dump the Electoral College. A summary of their responses would be, it's a once in a lifetime thing, Frank. Not worth the fight, won't happen again. <laughs> Fast forward to 2016, it happens again. Donald Trump loses by three million votes but becomes our president. In the days after the election, as you might imagine, those friends who differed with me years ago dialed up and rang my phone off the hook to say, mia culpa, we have to unplug the electoral college so this won't happen again. Well, just as phones no longer have dials or rings or hooks, no one actually said those things to me. None of those people called me to say they were wrong. But I'd like to believe they were having those thoughts, and perhaps you are too. So where does the Electoral College come from? 
Neutralizing the Electoral College not only strengthens our democracy and sends a message of repudiation to Donald Trump, it addresses a timely issue too. Confederate monuments are symbols of white supremacy that should come down. But the Electoral College is essentially a much worse slavery era monument that has fueled white supremacy for centuries. It inaugurated as president the second place candidate who repealed Reconstruction in 1876. George W. Bush's Supreme Court picks tipped the scales against the Voting Rights Act and campaign finance laws. The conventional wisdom, and, this, and what you probably learned in school from those history teachers, the conventional wisdom is that the founders fabricated the Electoral College simply to protect the smaller states. But why don't any of the 50 states use that practice to protect the less populated counties? if it's such an important democratic principle. And why don't any other democratic nations use an electoral college to choose their chief executive? The truth is that like a Confederate soldier on a pedestal, the electoral college originally stood on two legs, both of which skewed power in favor of the slave states. First, by counting enslaved non-voters as three-fifths of a person, Slave states gained more seats in the U.S. House as well as additional seats in the Electoral College. In 1800, Pennsylvania had 10% more free persons than the slave state of Virginia. But it also had 20% fewer electoral votes. Clearly this feature worked as intended. For the 32 of our first 36 years, Slave-owning Virginians held the presidency due to the Electoral College. Granted, this practice no longer applies, but it reveals the poison ground from which the undemocratic Electoral College grew. And it explains its total absence from other democracies. Second, regardless of size, each state also received a pair of electors to match its two U.S. senators. These two votes per state in the Electoral College were another means for putting the slave owners heavy thumbs on the scale of democracy. This feature still benefits small states, many of which are in the old Confederacy, but we don't have to live with the dead hands of the slave owners tucked into our ballot boxes forever. How can we fix this? Striking the Electoral College from the Constitution but can only be done with a two-thirds vote of Congress and the endorsement of 38 of the 50 states. So it won't be happening under the present congressional leadership. But there is a quicker legal workaround called the Interstate Compact. Website is National Popular Vote. It's on your handout on the, maybe on, on, on the front or the back. Maybe it's on the front and the back. 11 states with 165 electoral votes have already approved this compact which commits their electors to the winner of the national popular vote. So even if that state votes for candidate X, but candidate Z won the national vote, their electors go to the winner of the national vote. When states with another 105 electors, because 270 are required to win the presidency, when it, when, so when another set of states with 105 electors support the compact, the electoral college becomes meaningless. If enough citizens on the left, right, and center, never Trumpers, are you listening? If they want to ensure that our next president is the one with the most votes in 2020, then we have to elect a lot of pro-compact state legislators in 2018. Only then can we dismantle the biggest, most dangerous monument from our slave-owning past and send a message to President Trump too. So, so did that sound like Somebody talking to you, or did that sound like something read out of a book? Pardon? Somebody talking to you. Thank you. Which, which states have approved the compact? If you look on the, so now, good question, which states have approved this compact? If you will look on the back side of your handout. Because one of the things I'm hoping or expecting to have happen is that, uh, as this argument I'm making that the Electoral College is a white supremacy tool, as that becomes more prevalent knowledge and people realize how dangerous this mechanism is to our democracy, that other states will join these 11. Um, and do I have that 
front of me. Yeah. So the 12, if you're looking at the, so you might recognize something in common that these states have. California, DC, Hawaii, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington. Uh, they had an, uh, there was a move afoot to put this uh, interstate compact in place after 2000. So 11 states went with it uh, in um, 35 state legislative chambers across the country have passed it. This has passed in one or two chambers of a number of other states, but either the governor didn't sign it or the second chamber didn't approve it over the past few years. The uh, Virginia is one of the states that had not approved the interstate compact, but I'll bet you a year ago, nobody was expecting that the Democrats would sweep the uh, legislative elections the way they did this time. And so when I ran this uh, op-ed, ran in the Richmond paper, several people wrote in comments saying they were gonna like work on getting Virginia on board with this. So, yeah, somebody has a question? Okay, you're just waving at me, all right. <laughs> so one of my goals is to get the Democratic Party of Durham and then the Democratic Party of North Carolina, as well as other parties, to endorse Cell phones off, please. And um, is to endorse resolution that they want our legislators to vote for this compact so that North Carolina will no longer be uh, helping the Electoral College work. And so on the handout, I have uh, links to the Democratic Party so you can find out who your precinct is and who your precinct chair is, the Republican Party, the Libertarian Party, the Green Party. Uh, and on the back is a draft of a motion that, uh, so I'm going to be bringing this to my uh, precinct, precinct 20. If anybody is in precinct 20, which meets at the Ag Building, I hope to see you there. Uh, I've got the date in my calendar. It's in February, precinct meetings, and then I think the county meetings in March. Does anybody know the dates? Got to get active. What? The date of what? The precinct meetings. Yep. Two week range around that. Right. Like ours is over six. Uh, February 10th, a lot more, but there, there's a range. Great. And so you've got on the uh, front of your handout, you've got the link to your whatever party you're in. You can find them there, find out about your precinct meetings. Uh, and then I have a draft. In order to render the Electoral College meaningless and ensure that future presidents are only elected by winning the popular vote, we move that. Our organization supports the National Vo Popular Vote Interstate Compact by demanding that our representatives and senators in the North Carolina General Assembly enter and support legislation entitled the agreement among the states to elect a president by the National Popular Vote, duh. <laughs> this act will require North Carolina electors to give their votes to the presidential candidate who's the winter winner of the National Popular Vote once enough states with 270 more electors have joined the Interstate Compact. And then you can, uh, the, the, the model legislation is on the website for the national popular vote. So I've got a link there. And um, you might be wondering, God, why didn't I hear about this back in 2000? And if you go to the national popular vote and you click on, I think it's the about us, you'll find it's a long list of very academic looking older white guys whose marketing sense is, just, I would say, not very good. <laughs> you know, I mean, look at the, the it's like, who's going to accidentally Google national popular vote? <laughs> but uh, so, so if anybody, if you have like an 11 year old in your house who's good at like internet things, you know, hook them up with these people. They really could use the help getting the word out because it's, uh, it's a concept that I think sells itself once you put it out there for people. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, I don't want the loser to be my president anymore. Especially when arguably the two of the last three presidents who have the office because the Electoral College are arguably the worst presidents ever, right? So there's some kind of link there. Um, the, uh, and you might, so the Electoral, so how does this get us, let us do this without dealing with the Constitution? So the Constitution basically just says each state has their Electoral College delegates and each state can tell those delegates to do whatever you want them to do. If, if North Carolina want to pass a law, I said that North, our Electoral College delegates will just stay home and do nothing. 
We can pass, theoretically, we can pass a law and say that. Most of the states say that their electoral college delegate will vote for the candidate that won that state on pain of a significant fine like, <clears throat> like $10,000. Some states like Maine, which have two congressional districts, uh, the way they set it up is their, um, uh, their electoral college delegates vote depending on which, um, which district they're in. So their votes can be split, which is often the case in Maine. So any state can tell their delegates to do whatever they want them to. So the 11 states that have already signed on with this are telling their delegates that like, okay, even if uh, the candidate, even if Hillary had won New York, but if she had lost the national popular vote, then the New York delegates would go to whoever won the popular vote, right? And so you can see where there's gonna be some immediate resistance there are, there are reasons for people to argue against this, but just because a person has a reason to argue against something doesn't mean it's a real good reason. So in our case, if North Carolina had been on board with this and enough other states had been on board and North Carolina had voted for Donald Trump, our delegates would have voted for the actual winner, Hillary. And you can see where some people would not like that, but it's the larger argument is that as a nation, we're electing the person who leads the whole nation. And of course, the loser is going to have some places where they win, but there is no sound democratic principle that says they should therefore win by coming, be the president by coming in second place, right? So you will run into arguments why we should keep it the way it is, and don't let that discourage you. And that actually brings me to um, one of the best tools for being an effective activist is to stop talking, which I, which I know a lot of activists for whom that will be hard. <laughs> but it's when you stop talking that you become an active listener. And this, was, this is the tool I learned in my teens and 20s in doing politics, is that when you're trying to persuade someone of something, this is Joanne Abel, used to be stalwart of the library, still probably a volunteer. So if she and I disagreed on something, and I'm trying to persuade her, I'm not gonna be super effective if I'm just like downloading all my reasons to do this thing. She, she'll just be listening going, yep, I don't care about that, I don't care about that, I don't care about that, I don't care about that either. And just look at me and say, no thanks, or probably something less friendly. But if I've been like listening to her, if I bring up this electoral college issue, and I say, so what do you think about this? And she says, well, I think this and this and this and this then I've basically, she's given me a roadmap of what matters to her. Because nobody is gonna do, make their political choices based on your self-interest. They're only gonna make a political choice based on their own self-interest. And if you wanna persuade a person, you have to have a map of their self-interest, which they will happily give you when you stop talking. <laughs> really, this is guaranteed to work. Because people don't like silence. This is, I, when I was a young man and went to school, I, I studied psychology because it was interesting. I didn't realize that people went to college, that, it, that college was like vocational school for rich kids. <laughs> you know, nobody in my milieu went to college. I just thought, oh, it's school. I learn things. Fun. And then I want to realize, oh, if I get a psychology degree, I have to work in psychology. That's when I decided I have to like drop out of college. <laughs> I was a very successful college dropout, but I can tell you more about that later. <laughs> But one of the great things I learned in psychology is that one, a psychological technique is, you know, when you're dealing with a patient or a friend or whatever, that when you stop talking, the silence makes them feel like they need to fill the space. And people really like to broadcast who they are and how they feel and what they're thinking. And if you're wanting to persuade them, you need that information because they don't care why you're in favor of the electoral college or pro-choice or any of those things. They don't care why you are doing it. They care about what matters to them. And when you know what matters to them, you can then be persuasive. Um, I appreciated the um, uh, applause on the living wage thing. And I'm going to tell you how I was able to get that through. Back in those days, there were 13 council members. Uh, like a third of us were progressives, a third were Republicans, and a third were moderate Democrats. 
And so the four of us who were progressives were like, oh yeah, living wage, we want that right now. No problem. The others were like, didn't even know what it was. Like one person, uh, I said, hey, we need a living wage. They said, a living wage? Are you talking about severance pay? <laughs> Frank, they, the concept was just alien in 1995 when I first brought it up. And uh, so, but I was listening to what their concerns were about wages and business. And so when I came to try to line up their votes on the living wage, I didn't tell them about like, oh, this is going to help those poor people, which is all my allies want to talk about all day long. We need a living wage to help those poor people. And I'm like, well, the Republicans, there are Republicans who care about poor people. But these Republicans mostly didn't care about poor people. <laughs> and the, cons the moderate conservative Democrats kind of cared, but cared at least as much, if not more, about businesses. And living wage was always sold as something that would hurt businesses. But the facts, the evidence, the numbers show that paying a living wage to your entry level people means that you'll have less absenteeism, right? You'll have uh, less turnover. So your mid-level managers spend less time interviewing and hiring and training and filling in for people. So your, your productivity, your organization goes up the same way the productivity would go up if you spent more money in your at your manufacturing plant for a better machine instead of the cheapest machine that breaks down. Right? So when I went to the other council members, it was because I'd listened to them. They didn't care about poor people. They cared about business. So I had like 10 reasons why this was good for business and why it was also good for taxpayers. You're always hearing from conservatives, oh, we got taxpayers, taxpayers. And I'm like, yeah, if the entry level people get paid more wages, they need less food stamps. So when we pay people so much less, that means that taxpayers are subsidizing those businesses by providing food stamps and other things, right? So those were the arguments I made and caught hell for it from progressives. <laughs> no, no, Frank, we gotta talk about those poor people. I'm like, I'm not talking about the poor people. We already got the poor people carrying votes. I need the taxpayer and business owner carrying votes, and that's how we got nine votes to win on living wage, is because of listening. So listening gets you the person's uh, self-interest. When you have their self-interest, you can make them see how what you want gets them what they want, and then you start winning. So any questions about that? Yes, in the back. Mine is a little different from sure. what you're talking about. Sure, go ahead. I, I need to take a drink of water anyway, so perfect time. Fighting back against white supremacy. Yeah. And having this map of self interest. Yeah. Reparations is one that's going to have to be dealt with. But that's a fight on our self interest, African Americans, mm -hmm. and nobody will to talk about it from the really the Democratic Party or justice people or whatever or what is still owed. Yeah, you're totally right. I agree with you in every way. And um, one of the hurdles on that is that we're in an environment. Let me back up for a minute. So reparations. Different people have different numbers for it, but it's a really big number. The present fights, where we've got some folks who want to require people receiving Medicaid and food stamps to work and do drugs, all these things. So the, the social welfare benefits that we have in place now, it's hard to keep the funding from being cut. You know, and these two pots of money aren't the same and don't have the same uh, rationale. But one is very big and nobody has done it yet. The other one is not as big and it's, we're having a hard time keeping it from being cut. So your argument has lots of merit, but in the on the ground politics, if we're gonna lose, if we're in the state where we're losing on just keeping the funds that we have now that help people who are struggling, then we aren't gonna get traction on this other one for a long time. And I'm not saying that because I disagree with you. I'm saying that because personally, I have finite amount of time and energy. There may be some activists here who have infinite time and energy and they can fight on all the fights for their entire lives and multiple lives after that. I'd like to have them on my team. But everybody here I think has finite time and finite energy and so we have to be judicious. We are all judicious in where we put our time and energy. 
We decide what, what our self-interest is and what matters most. And for some people, what matters most is going to be reparations, and they're going to fight on that regardless of how the fight goes, and that's a good thing. Other people are fighting on food stamps, Medicaid, Obamacare, on, 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 you know, a lengthy list of things. And I'm not going to say anybody's fight is more important than other people's fight, because that's like a personal feeling, and I have nothing to say about that. What I can say, which is what I've said here, is that the Electoral College, if you put it in the concept of white supremacy and slavery era uh, heritage, the monuments we're fighting now are bad and should come down. This is much worse and should come down. So I'm trying to put it in, trying to put the Electoral College in a perspective that makes sense in a context that people can see how bad it is, that this is not just like a good government, you know, boring civics class thing. This is slave owner Thomas Jefferson becoming president when he lost the election. This is about a Republican in 1876 becoming a president and destroying Reconstruction, one of the best things this country did. This is about George Bush losing the election and becoming president and putting two conservatives on the Supreme Court who then gutted the Voting Rights Act, which created the environment for what I call Jim Crow 2.0. All that voter suppression, if, if those two people had not been put on the Supreme Court, if, if uh, Al Gore had put two liberals on instead, that would have never happened. Overturn of Citizens United that made the 1% even more powerful on election day. That would never have happened without the Electoral College. Donald Trump winning the election and putting segregationist Jesse Helms' protege, Tom Farr, on a lifetime appointment in a judgeship which the Republicans will approve, no matter what any of us do or say. That's happening. That's coming. That's because of the Electoral College. And, and I don't, and I'm not, and not, so I want to, so in putting that in perspective, because I've caught some flat for saying, oh, it's the worst slavery era thing, and so many people think I'm dissing the folks fighting on the uh, monuments, and I'm not. I'm putting it in a context of white supremacy and helping people see how powerful it is, and the monuments, let me, let me tell you a story about the monuments. So for 20 years, a handful of times, it's occurred to me when I'm thinking about what I'm going to write about, what am I going to take action on, and I would sit down and I would think, I'm going to write about that uh, Confederate monument in front of the courthouse. How we need to do something about that, whether we need to put some other monument next to it or put a sign explaining what a bunch of hooey, some of the uh, history of it is, or tear it down, melt, whatever. And I would sit down and I'd start to write it and I'd think, you know, Frank, come on. If, if the black community of Durham thought that monument was important to deal with, they would have dealt with it. Bill Bell, while he was county commissioner or mayor, would have brought something up. Deborah Giles, Marianne Black, Dr. Livonia Allison. The black community in Durham is not monolithic, but they have power and influence, and they can decide what they want to work on. And if they are deciding to not work on this, I suspect it's because they realize if we do that, we're just going to be poking a bunch of racists in the eye when we could let a sleeping dog lie. And the energy, the finite energy we spend going round and round with this monument, we could spend working on affordable housing, transit, job training, summer youth programs, many things that will have an impact. Some people might make the case, oh, they were just scared. And those of us who tore down the monument, you know, this however months ago, we're the brave ones. And all those black Durham leaders were scared to deal with it. Whatever argument they want to make, I'm kind of like, I think those leaders made a good choice. They put their energy, their finite energy into something else. Some people want to tear down the monuments now. Fine, I support that. I think, no, I know, when all the monuments are down, people are going to feel good that day, and after that they're going to be a little disappointed that not much more has happened. Not much has changed. And I can give you a concrete example of that. I'm from South Carolina. I was glad to see that woman climb the flagpole and take down the uh, Confederate flag. I was glad in a ambivalent way when, what's her name, Haley, Nikki Haley, got the line up the votes and took down the flag, although she'll probably use that to help her win the presidency 
in a few rounds, perhaps with the help of the Electoral College, if we like drop the ball this time again, right? So they got the flag down, hooray. Is there any measurable change for black people or working people in South Carolina? Probably in the long term, there may be beneficial changes, but I don't think it's gonna be much applied to the flag. The, the one measurable change I was able to find in South Carolina is that, uh, you know, we would hope that this would get more people, young people especially, coming to vote and working on campaigns and running for office. But in South Carolina, the number of uh, Democratic seats in their state house went down by two after the flag came down. And I'm not saying that to knock anybody, but I'm saying that to make this sad and unfortunate, but I think true point that when all the monuments are down and the energy has been spent to do that and they should come down, we will be a little disappointed that it hasn't gotten us more change on the ground that we would like to see. And what I'm offering is that when we tear this one down, we don't have George Bush's being elected and appointing conservatives to Supreme Court. We don't have Donald Trump's being elected, embarrassing us and hurting us on a daily basis and being out and out racist and stirring up racists who had been for a long time pretty happy just to stay home, really. So I think there's in your finite time and your finite energy to change Durham and change the world, there is a lot of payback on this. And we don't need a constitutional amendment, we just need a majority of the North Carolina legislature to do this. It's doable. Yes, so we had a couple of questions. Uh, this gentleman and then this woman. Yeah. Basically, uh, what I hear you saying over and over again is that the electoral quote, college, unquote, is the linchpin upon which many of these problems are hooked. Yeah. Yeah. You're the linchpin, and a lot of these problems can be. Care yeah, it's, it's dormant for long periods of time. Like from 1800 to 1876, it didn't do anything to hurt us. From 1876 to 2000, it didn't do anything. But it's picking up speed. And here's one of the things I'm really afraid of is, uh, is, there, is there anybody here who's been following all the gerrymandering stuff? Yeah, a little bit, a couple people, okay. Which, which I'm gonna, I, I think we need to, the gerrymandering is an old term from like 1805 or something, and it's time for a 21st century update. I think we should call it jerry-rigging. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You know, a little more descriptive, a little more accurate. Um, but the, but the jerry-rigging thing has become more of a deal because of computers. Thank you, Silicon Valley. Because in the old days, when the, you know, so when the Democrats were doing the jerry-rigging, it was like on an envelope. Oh, what if we do this? What if we do that? And so they would skew things so that if the vote between Democrats and Republicans in the state was like 50-50, they might get seven of the seats and the Republicans would get six. With the advent of computers, the Republicans have been able to go like almost house by house. It used to be counties would be kept whole with the jerry-rigging. And, and it used to be precincts were kept whole, but they don't do that. They're just like, if Joanne and I can live, be neighbors and they will draw the line between us if that makes it so they can get what they have now, which is a state that's split like 50-50, but the Republicans get 10 of the seats and the Democrats get three. That's computers that did that for us. And I will guarantee you, I would like to bet somebody money so I could take their money, <laughs> that there's a Republican team and possibly a Democratic team too, right now working on computers like, okay, how do we, lose the popular vote for president in 2020, but win with the Electoral College. Think about, put the jerry-rigging that's been going on and say, what if somebody, somebody, so Trump lost by three million votes. That was like the biggest spread in a long time, three million votes. So with that kind of jerry-rigging computer analysis, maybe somebody could lose by like 5 million or 10 million votes and still, with all these little states, get enough electoral college votes. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain? Well, no, oh, I'm sorry, it's behind you. Then you're next. Uh, what I don't sorry. understand is that I've never heard it presented uh, in the context of, with the electoral college, you lose the power of your vote. And that, you lose the power of your individual vote. Right, yes. And I never heard it presented that way, but that's really pretty powerful. Yeah. If you talk to people and say, your vote 
it's not counting if you live in a state that the electoral college yes. is against who your candidate is. Whereas the popular vote is everybody counts the same. Yes, yeah, she's making the point that with the electoral college, it's, it's the principle of one person, one vote isn't really happening. And if you go to the national popular vote uh, site, to their credit, because they're academics, there is lots of information, pretty well written, that goes into, that addresses all the arguments your friends and your colleagues could make about why we should keep it this way. And because some people say, oh, but uh, if, if we get rid of electoral college, then all the campaigning is in New York and California and stuff. And it's like, I won't get, I don't want to get lost in the weeds of all that, but that's not really true. So please look at the site. You can learn a lot about um, this. You can, any objection anybody makes, you will have a strong answer here with that site. And so, and yes, you had a question. You've been waiting a while. I, I'm sorry. Sure. It's on the handout, uh, National Popular Vote, they, on the middle of the back page, it's on the front too perhaps, and uh, if you go there, there's lots of things to click on, uh, FAQs and the status of different states, um, things like that. To get to the model legislation, this is where they need an 11 year old to help them with their website because I had to search, there's the little, uh, the, the horizontal lines that indicate a drop down menu. I was probably using a computer for like 10 years before I knew what those were. I thought it was just decorative things, I don't know. <laughs> and so you click on those little horizontal lines in the upper corner and it'll come down and the last thing, it ought to be like first, right? But the last thing is the text of the bill. And you click on that and even then the, the model legislation, the text of the bill is buried in a bunch of text about other things. So, anyway, and yes, you're. Can you explain to us how the electoral college is currently constituted? How the electoral college is currently constituted is well, they they got rid of the forty percent discount on black people thing. <laughs> Civil war was costly, expensive, and horrible. That's gone. St still, there is, as this woman said, your vote is not equally counted because of the Senate, uh, which the Senate is a whole nother um, problem. But if the Electoral College was set up just on your, the, come on in. Oh, no, please come. <laughs> if it was just set up based on the number of people we have in the U.S. House, that would be fair, right? But each state, each of the 50 states also, and D.C., yeah, also gets two senators, right? Yeah, D.C. does, yeah, for some reason D.C. has three votes in Electoral College, and I'm wondering now how does that set up that way, but we don't have to figure that out right now. So, but each of the 50 states gets, has two senators, and so that's like two extra votes on top. So some states only have one or two representatives but they get two senators on top of that. And so like Wyoming, uh, a voter in Wyoming has much more representation in the Electoral College than a voter in California. So it's, it's very much distorted in the favor of small states, which let me, um, while we're talking about that, let me put, give you another context for this. A uh, phrase I've been using a lot is tyranny of the minority. And we're all familiar with the phrase tyranny of the majority. The founding fathers were rightly concerned about that. That's what the checks and balances are for, so that some group can't just run roughshod over another group, even though that seems to be happening sometimes. <laughs> so they were like inordinately concerned about tyranny of the majority. Good for them. What, we're, what I feel like we're suffering from is a tyranny of the minority. And the Electoral College has given us that. The minority votes for Donald Trump, and he becomes our president. In the Senate, because each state, regardless of population, has two seats. That means that you could take, uh, you could win election, your party could win like the 30, like the 26 smallest states, and you would rule the Senate, even though you only had like a third of the population of the country behind you. And that's kind of where we are now. The uh, Republican Party has had the majority in the Senate, but when you divvy up which states are represent, represented by Democrats and Republicans. A majority of Americans are represented by Democratic senators. A minority of Americans are represented by Republican senators, but they have a majority 
in the Senate. So that's tyranny of the minority. The House has, there's been a couple of periods, like 2012, where normally a president's coattails bring a bunch of people in. Obama's coattails did bring a bunch of voters, but because of jerry-rigging, even in states like North Carolina, where a majority of people had voted Democratic, a majority of the U.S. representatives went, were Republican. So in 2012, a minority of people in America voted Republican, but the Republican Party had a majority in the Congress. So there's a majority of people voting Republican for U.S. representatives now, so that doesn't ex exactly apply, but it could apply again. So, um, yes, you have, uh, in the green, you have a question. Um, you had mentioned, Maine, that their electoral votes get, set, get yeah. divided, and I think that's true in just a handful of states. Maybe Nebraska or Kansas, yeah. one of them like that. Do you have any data that, that you would know of that would indicate whether if all of the states had to so she's asking if the Electoral College, instead of the whole state going for candidate X or Y, if the electoral delegates were divvied up by um, house districts, would it be different? Oh, by the popular vote in the state. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever the popular vote in the state, if 40% of the people voted for Trump and 60% sure. voted for Oh, if you're, so if it was divided up just purport, like proportionally, um, what would happen? I haven't looked at that. I don't know. Nobody's trying to make that happen, which is another issue, is that uh, another piece of being an effective activist. We could sit here and we could kick around like five or ten other ways to do things different with the Electoral College. And we might be so sophisticated and accurate in our analysis that we come up with something that would work better than what these people are proposing, the national popular vote people. And even if I believe what we came up with worked better, I would not work on it. Not because it wasn't good, but because you are starting from zero in terms of momentum and effectiveness. And you would be putting yourself in competition with, I think, a uh, pretty good system that already has 11 states, 11 states, 10 states, already has 11, 10 or 11 states on board. Mm -hmm. They're most of the way to the 270 votes they need. Mm -hmm. And so again, this is part of deciding how to be an effective activist, which I think anything you do to become a more effective activist also makes you a more effective person. Mm -hmm. And a more effective person is going to be more uh, of a happy person, a more productive person, more valued by others. So the things I'm suggesting, like listening, <laughs> or being judicious with your finite time and energy are valuable as an activist, but like even more valuable just in your daily life. So yes, we could come up with something better, perhaps, but I wouldn't work on that because there's something pretty good that already has momentum and that other people are already working on. We'd have to make them stop working on what they're doing and come around to our alternative. And this is a, uh, this is a uh, brings up a common, uh, and if you any spend any time in politics, you'll hear this phrase, don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Right? Because any notion you put out there is somewhere on a spectrum of like not very good, kind of good, great, wonderful. So sometimes you have to let go of the thing you think is perfect because you want to get something good enough through. And that's kind of what democracy is about is like putting together enough people uh, so that you can have a coalition because there's no victory without a majority, there's no majority without a coalition, there's no coalition without imperfect allies. <laughs> That's the reality of life. Yes, sir, in the back. Question for you. Yeah. On the uh, motion that you had, yeah. I don't see anything that addresses sanctions uh, or fines that can be put. I know one state in this last election had a fine for somebody who voted. Right. Uh, and they voted anyway yeah. against the state. Right. Um, so if, what kind of fine could be levied that a candidate couldn't under the you know, cover of pay and sanctions to this that would stop that from happening? Good question. So his question, and I'm trying to remember to repeat the question so they go into the microphone so that uh, it goes on the, uh, the video which we played on the YouTubes. 
So he's asking uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, that when a, if a delegate doesn't vote the way the state requires them to, they can be fined. And he's asking, does this uh, model legislation include that? And, and what I have printed out is just a draft of a motion that someone might bring to their precinct meeting. It's not the model legislation is not on the handout. That's on the website. And I give you specific directions on their convoluted route to get there. But it takes, it'll take you like 10 seconds. Uh, and so the model legislation may or may not have some kind of fine that requires people to vote for the Hillary Clinton candidate instead of the Donald Trump candidate. Uh, you know, so I can't answer that question. I, I've read through it and I don't remember if it had something like that or not. Uh, and yeah, so somebody could just like buy their way to vote the way they wanted. Yeah, and, and so that's another issue. There's always, in, and there's, no, um, there's no perfect solution to any of our problems. You can always find somebody, well, what if, you know, what if the moon is full <laughs> and the parking lot is empty and then this thing happens and it's kind of like, yeah, that could happen. How much time do we have to like plug that loophole? That's always the question. It's always finite time, finite energy. How are you going to allocate it? Can you, when you decide what you think is best, have you listened enough to persuade people? And, and this gentleman has a question. I'm, I need to tell you a story about myself that kind of only occurred to me recently. So, I, so this year, strangely, makes 40 years I've been doing politics. So I was 18, my first year at college, fell in with some people doing politics, and we worked on a campaign trying to unseat Strom Thurmond. We lost, but he is now dead. So sometimes that's, you, that's the best satisfaction you're gonna get in politics, sometimes. Uh, and so that was my introduction to politics. And so I explore lots of different activists, lots of different parties, Democratic Party, Libertarians, Green Party, Democratic Socialists, everybody, you know, all the different shades of Democrats. Because as somebody said in the old days, it's like the Democratic Party was like five parties when it was a one party state here. And uh, looking back, I realized I couldn't have verbalized it at that time. But looking back, I realized what I was searching for what I was recognizing was that there's lots of people in politics, every stripe of politics, you will find people who can draw and describe this perfect future world up in a cloud. It's just perfect. You know, the libertarians and the anarchists are both real good at this. <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you know, they're, they're seen as being on opposite sides of the political spectrum. But uh, they, they, my, um, close experiences with a lot of them. I've been friends with a lot of libertarians, a lot of anarchists. Uh, I haven't been attracted to their politics, but I like them personally sometimes. And the sense I get is that both of them have this notion that if all of us will act in this certain way, like me the libertarian or like me the anarchist, if everybody acts this way, we can then have a libertarian or anarchist world with almost no government. And I'm kind of like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I hardly want to act like you. <laughs> but, it's, but they'll draw this castle in the sky, castle in the clouds, right? And so everybody does that. And my search was always about who could take their castle in the clouds and like turn it into some kind of like garden of reality <laughs> on the ground where you and I could hop in a car and go to some neighborhood and say, oh, the people in that trailer park, the people in that project, the people in that public housing, the people in this working class neighborhood, their lives are better. Because it's something that wasn't perfect, but it was good, and we figured out how to make it happen. Making something happen in politics is just really hard. Most people, most of the time, fail at what they're trying to do, which is a sad thing to say, and it's not because their goals aren't good, it's because I'm just gonna be honest here. In my experience, most activists' skills are not high. Think about how much effort you went to to educate yourself on your trade or your skill or your profession. You spent a lot of time. And yet people will read the newspaper, get all pissed off, and run for office. Thinking, oh yeah, I can, I can do this. I can put this on the ground, make this happen. And mostly they can't, right? They can make a good speech and that rouses people. They can organize a rally, but they don't always get the results. And so 
that's why I'm trying to share some of these things. I'd like for you to be able to take your little, whatever castle in the cloud you're thinking of and figure out how to bring it down to the ground so that once you've done your 40 years of politics or four years of politics, you can hop in the car and you can drive and show me something that really happened. Because I grew up in a trailer park. My father only went to the eighth grade. My mother only went to college. Out of like 60 cousins, only me, my sister, and two other cousins went to college. So when I'm doing politics, I'm not thinking like, oh, do I feel like the hero here? I'm thinking like, am I gonna be able to go and see something better in the trailer park where a lot of people I grew up with still live, right? So I would suggest that you, even if you didn't grow up in a trailer park, you probably grew up near a trailer park. <laughs> Think about how, what's gonna happen really for those people. Are you gonna get the satisfaction of speaking truth to Facebook? Or is there something really gonna change in somebody's life? And so this gentleman had a question. Yeah, oh, no? Yes, over here, yes. I just want to know, and I know you can't answer exactly or anything close to exactly, but just in your experience, how far are we really away from this possibility? <laughs> okay, if you've only got a couple hours to do politics, you should, no, I'm not picking on you, pick something else. Find a good topic and spend your time speaking truth to the Facebook, right? Um, I'm not asking anybody to devote their time full time, quit your job or anything, or only do this in your spare time. I'm suggest, part of the reason I'm suggesting this is because to me this looks like a doable piece of work that doesn't require people to like be full time on it. it like I said, once you educate yourself about it, it sells itself. And once you bring it up to people and ask them what they think about the Electoral College, then you can like address their concerns and bring them on board. So uh, in terms of timeline, so where are we? So this is January 2018. There's gonna be primaries in the spring for the State House and the State Senate of North Carolina. And then, in, and for some of those seats, the primary is it because they've been jerry-rigged so only a Republican can win or only a Democrat can win. And so that's why the precinct meetings and the county and state conventions this spring are important. To get the Democratic Party, Republican Party, the Libertarians, the Greens to agree. This makes sense. Yeah, the two worst presidents we've ever had were both put there by the Electoral College and it's a freaking white supremacy nightmare thing. Right? That it's not just like some boring civic class good government thing. This is like a dangerous instrument that is really messing with us. Uh, and so if you're looking for some short-term thing to do, it's to bone up on this a little bit, find out where your precinct meeting is. If you're not already you know, registered as a member of a party, go contact the Board of Elections. I'm not sure what there, maybe somebody here can say, can you just do it online or do you need to go down there if you're not already? To change part, thank you. So to change, if you're not already a Democrat or a Republican, if you're what people call independent, but I think that's wrong. I don't think those people are independent. They're just unaffiliated. And, and, and to my mind, a working person voting for a Republican is like a chicken voting for the butcher. I don't understand it. <laughs> some of you may understand. I think we have some Republican friends here and nothing against you. I don't think you're butchers. It's a metaphor. <laughs> but if you're not already a member of a party, figure out which side of the barricade you are on. And as I said earlier, the key to victory, there is no political victory without a majority. There's no majority without a coalition. There's no coalition without imperfect allies. So if you have a problem voting for candidate X, Y, or Z, or belonging to party X or Y because of some of the people, it's kind of like, you just need to get over it. Do, you need to do what my lesbian friends say. It's time to pull on your big girl panties. <laughs> and just get over yourself. There's, people in America are different. They're not all gonna agree with you. That doesn't mean you have to unfriend them on Facebook. I'm really disappointed in those people. That's just not good politics. Those are, that's the kind of practice that indicates an activist who loses a lot. When they're unfriending people, oh, I didn't like what he said, and it might have been a horrible thing. But if that's your way of doing politics, then you are an activist who loses a lot. So, <laughs> 
So back to your timeline. So this is the time to get active with your political party. Go to your precinct meeting, introduce this resolution. They'll want to work with you on the wording of it and don't feel like you have to own it. Having a death grip on things is, is like the death knell for your goal. Part of being a, in a democracy is when you come to a meeting, a precinct meeting, a county convention, whatever, people are gonna wanna mess with your proposal. Expect that. Be an adult about it, you know? It's like being married. Do you get everything you want when you're married? No. <laughs> right? But you've learned to figure it out and live with it, and, that, and politics, democratic, po small d democratic politics is like that. People are gonna mess with your resolution, let them do that. Focus on the big thing, getting this passed at my precinct level. And then hopefully we'll be helping each other at the county level and then at the state level getting it passed. And then, the, um, and then all of the candidates that we have will know that voters want this thing. And they'll be educated about it. There'll still be work to do. Having something in the platform in uh, county convention is March, the state convention, pardon? and the state convention, probably April, before the primaries. You'll find, it'll be on the website. But so that's like the short-term thing to do. Get it in the platform, that makes it easier to put pressure on the uh, elected officials. And it doesn't have to just be the, the parties. I'm also, I've also introduced this uh, resolution, I'm a member of Durham People's Alliance. And so the action team I'm on, where we deal with income inequality, which Electoral College has certainly contributed to that, so the 14 people at that action team voted unanimously, yeah, we want PA to support this. And so whatever political group, your neighborhood association, get your neighborhood association to sign up that you want this and then send letters to your uh, legislators. So you've got a question and then the gentleman there, yes. Uh, along with your short term, uh, there's several organizations, one uh, it's called Flip NC, that's worth working with in the short term to try to get the uh, state house back in the hands. Yeah, so she's mentioned there's a group called Flip NC, trying to flip it from the state house, the General Assembly in Raleigh, from being uh, heavily Republican to being Democrat. Which is and also aimed at the, the, to end the Jerry, what you're calling The Jerry rigging, rigging, yes. And, um, and some people go, oh, that's just not gonna happen, it's so tough in North Carolina. Well, a year ago, nobody thought the Democrats were gonna sweep Virginia. Right. Nobody thought that. And nobody thought a Democrat was gonna be elected senator in Alabama. <laughs> Although hopefully we won't need the Republican candidates to be like that horrible. <laughs> wow, wow, you couldn't even, we couldn't even ima I've imagined how bad does a Republican need to be? Let's see. <laughs> nobody could have imagined that. So there are other organizations that you can bring this to. Your neighborhood association, any political group you're in, your party, and yes. And the gentleman, and then uh, Betsy. Can you just educate, uh, maybe I'm the only one, I have to admit, I don't know how um, the role of the precinct meeting, how that would play in getting this up hand. Yes, so he's asking what role does the precinct meeting play? So the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, have uh, Libertarians, Greens, have roughly similar hierarchical shape. So there's a national level organization that hosts the big conventions that some people watch on TV. I do not, but some people do, right? So that's the national level. And everything they're debating, all their resolutions they're debating came from state level conventions. And everything they debate at the state level conventions comes from all the county conventions. And everything they debate at the county conventions comes from the precinct meetings and a precinct might be, what's the rough population of a precinct? I don't, there's like 50 or 60 precincts in Durham County? Yeah. So there's 57, there's like, uh, yeah, the size varies. It's only the party platform that we're talking about today. Right, the party platform is in terms of the parties, yeah, so for something to be at the national or the state level, it has to start in somebody's precinct. And ideally, if there's like five or 10 or 20 precincts, I'll basically say the same thing. Then when you get to the county level, there's a bunch of people who are like, yeah, we want this. We're already invested in it. We're already educated on it. Yes, right. Yeah, so, so like the 50 some precincts in Durham, each of them might vote on like 10 resolutions 
that some are the same and some are different. And then by the time you get to the county, some of those fall away, some are combined. It's just, that's, that's just small d democracy. Uh, I encourage everybody to get a piece of that. Uh, and again, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Listen, so that, because listening is the main thing that makes you persuasive. And then look for, create coalitions of imperfect allies. You know, people complain about limousine liberals. I think the real problem is litmus test liberals. You know, it's kind of like, oh, you didn't agree with me on this thing, so I just don't want to hear anything you have to say. I've confronted that many times, and I just don't let it bother me. Here's another thing. Don't let people's disagreement with you. Don't take it personally. Who here saw the movie Matrix? Maybe one or two people saw Matrix. You know, and so Keanu Reeves, you know, it's people shoot at him, and he kind of like, ah, and the bullet goes, zoo. Let that be your self-image. When people say a dumb or mean thing or criticize your proposal, uh, it isn't about you. It really is not about you. Those people arguing with you or disagreeing with you are not staying up at night thinking how to antagonize you. They just have their opinion that may be an informed opinion, in which case you should listen to it, or it may be an uninformed opinion, in which case you should still listen to it, but try not to like roll your eyes. And <laughs> Because you can't win without a coalition of imperfect allies. That's just the nature of democracy. And the great thing about democracy is that we can disagree because we're humans are going to disagree, but we can disagree without having a knife fight. <laughs> right? It won't be like when Yugoslavia broke up. It won't be like Syria. So anyway, um, so I got a uh, um, couple little things I want to mention before we wrap up, and I can still take some questions. So, so here, here it was, I, I was really sure Trump came in second place and they had you know, sworn in Hillary, but you tell me I'm wrong. So, but I've, been send, I've started sending these second place ribbons to um, Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, kind of like a participation trophy. You know, ah, oh, you suck, but you still came, so you get a little trophy, right? So. Uh, if you're curious about that little program, that's on my website, Blue Collar Comeback. There's a link on the handout. Uh, so I sent them on the anniversary of his, swear on the inauguration. Uh, I had support from some people and sent 101 of these. Enough to share with his staff, because I'm sure they'll all want one, right? And uh, uh, so my goal is for his birthday on June 14th to send him a whole bunch more. State of the Union Well, that's like very, you know, that's like 10 days after the inauguration, so. Right, so that's uh, something uh, you might want to help, uh, you know, remind, he, he seems to forget, you know, I, I realize you're right, he did win and get, a not, get sworn in, but he seems to forget that he lost, so. Um, and the other thing is like, I'll, I'll bet at least one person has wondered why is this guy dressed like this? <laughs> is there, is there, you've, you've wondered, yeah, I knew he, he had that quiz, like, uh, uh, I don't understand. So, so, um, the, uh, the red strings, so who here grew up in North Carolina, went to North Carolina schools? I didn't, but if you did, raise your hand. Went to North Carolina schools. So you had North Carolina history teachers, right? So all of y'all know who the red, red, red strings are. Nobody knows who the red strings are. So but you know who the regulators are, right? So because the regulator bookshop, and there, so in the 1760s and 70s, some people were fighting the king. They were the regulators. Well, that was just a few hundred people. The red, string, the red strings was like tens of thousands of people in North Carolina and the Southeast who fought the Confederacy, right? They didn't you didn't learn about that during the sesquicentennial 150 thing? They didn't like make a whole day out of that? So, so yeah, so, um, so that's what this is about. So the red strings was kind of the nickname for a group in North Carolina, started in North Carolina during the Civil War, they called themselves Heroes of America, which, okay, you're inside the Confederacy and you decide to fight the Confederacy, I'm like, yeah, that's more heroic than speaking truth to Facebook. I really do think so. And so the red string thing comes from a, some verses, I think in the book of Ruth in the Bible, uh, and I'm forgetting the details, some other people may know that um, book much better than I do, surprisingly. Um, but like, uh, so some oppressed community was having a problem and they needed to know who each other were and so to signal that like, yeah, I'm part of this, you know, oppressed group, they would put like red uh, ribbon or red string in their window, a little signal. 
so that if you were part of this resistance, this underground, you would know which was a safe house and who would help you and all that. And so these folks in North Carolina adopted this. So they would hang some red thread in their windows or, or you know, kind of like loosely sticking out like some random piece of loose thread in their suit. So nothing too conspicuous like what I'm doing, but so that they could signal each other. You know, in, uh, in Nazi Germany, there was a similar thing called the White Rose. And that's how they knew each other. And most of them were killed. But the red threads were much more successful because, as you should have learned, if I hope you, you know, in history class, there were like tens of thousands of Southerners in North Carolina, tens of thousands more in Virginia, Tennessee, other states, who were fighting the Confederacy, who were Unionists. They would sing Dixie, and I'm forgetting which line, but they would insert the word Union instead of Dixie, right? Um, and so they would provide safe houses. They were helping with the Underground Railroad. In some cases, they were like, uh, if you saw the movie Free State of Jones, did anybody see Free State of Jones? I definitely, just a great movie, but a very educational about the Civil War because there were a number of places like this. The, it's called the Free State of Jones because Jones County and a couple other counties deep in Mississippi, working class white folks were kind of like, yeah, this looks like rich man's war and a poor man's fight and I don't want to be part of it. Mm. And so there were whole counties in different parts of the South that were not ruled by the Confederacy, right? Whites and blacks fighting together. And the Red Strings was like the North Carolina group. And on top of this, the, um, what, what they should have been teaching you in class is that a lot of people have learned that like 200,000 of the Union soldiers were African American you know, freed slaves or escaped slaves. Another 200,000 were whites from the border states, which were slave states. So Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware allowed slavery, but 200,000 uh, whites from those states joined the Union Army. And then another 100,000 whites from the Confederate states joined the Union Army. So like a half a million of the soldiers in the Union Army were from the South, white and black. And they covered that in history class, right? No. So, so the red thread, so that's what the red thread is about, that a lot of our history has been poorly passed on to us by our history teachers and history professors who I'm not saying they're bad people, but they really should have, could have done a better job. And so if you have kids in school, you might want to play a role in making sure the history teachers are somehow up to speed on these things and not leading people to think that the Electoral College was just some nice thing because they felt, you know, kindly towards the small states. You know, it's much worse than that. And so the, the get up is, um, so this is the suit I bought to be married in. <laughs> so I have more than made my money back on it. <laughs> but it sits there in the closet and it's kind of like talking to me like, Frank, we need to do something. We need to like do something. And so I'm kind of kicking around this idea of like, you know, uh, I, I like Civil War reenactments, even though it's kind of a weird, dumb thing, right? But I think there needs to be some people doing the reenactment representing the red threads, mm -hmm. right? The unionists of the South. And so I'm thinking of creating the character of Dr. John Lewis Johnson, who was one of the leaders of the red threads. And uh, he was drafted in the Confederate Army right away at the first engagement, even though the doctor's in the back, right? He got captured by the Union. <laughs> union might have had some help, I think, in this. But he got captured by the Union, and then they did a thing called parole, where if you will swear not to rejoin the Confederate Army, they would set you free, so they don't have to like, keep you. So he's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll sign the parole. So he was sent back, and the Confederacy couldn't put him back in the Army because they had a similar arrangement with some Union soldiers. They would parole them, right? And so he was able to be an organizer of safe houses and Underground Railroad and, and uh, uh, smuggling arms and things like that to the South. So, because I feel like with the Electoral College and other things, it's kind of like the Civil War didn't really end, right? It's still kind of going on. And so it helps to like educate people a little bit about that. So, any, let me, let me take some last questions. So, uh, Betsy and then Maureen. Uh, my experience with resolution. Yes. Uh, this is about the prison thing. Yeah. Is that if they're worded the same, it makes the kind of convention a whole lot easier. Yes. Um, so, is there wording? on this website for a 
No, they don't have anything about precincts. It's like they have kind of dropped the ball on it. There's two things. One is that I have a, on the back, if I can borrow this from you, I just, this is just the shape of the resolution I've used with People's Alliance, and it's what I'm going to bring to the Democratic Party. Yeah, if everybody uses the same language, she's saying with, pre, with uh, resolutions, if everybody's language on the resolution is the same, it's easier just to, takes less time. Because everybody wants to be heard in a meeting and that takes time, right? So, um, so use this language if you're going to do that with your neighborhood, your political group, your d party precinct. And then the model language, it's got, there's, uh, I got the, the steps here, one, two, three, four, five, which will take you like 10 seconds of like how to find the model legislation on this national popular vote website. So you can just copy the model legislation, slap it on your resolution here, and that's the best you can do right there. And so uh, does that answer your question? Or uh, your comment, really? Yes. Thank you, Betsy, for making that point. Maureen? She's asking uh, where I mentioned on the handout, and, and, and I just copied and pasted something from National Popular Vote website that like, um, so there's the 11 states that have passed it and the governor signed it and they're good to go. And then there's a bunch of other states where one of their two houses passed it or the other house passed it or both houses passed it and the governor didn't sign it. And so when, when one or both houses, if they pass something and it doesn't become law that year, it goes away. So everybody starts from scratch. Technically, everybody starts from scratch. But if something had been introduced and debated before, then a lot of people are up to speed on it, which is an important thing to recognize. Right? If they already, so in some of these states, a lot of legislators, leg, legislators already know this. And I will bet there are people like me doing the same thing, trying to get this ball rolling in their state. Uh, as I said, I've heard from some Virginia people that they are working on getting Virginia on board, even though neither of the houses in Virginia had, um, had uh, entertained this bill. What other states are crossed? Uh, I don't know. If you, you can find that out at the National Popular Vote website and click on status of the states, and they will tell you which, you know, like some uh, one house in Oregon, I think, just passed it this year. Uh, uh, with, uh, in the past year, I think several states have got some momentum on it. So, uh, and somebody over here, you had a question? Yes. And then. Uh, can future governors and state legislatures be bound by what these 11 states, uh, somebody took a vote there, but right. is that binding? He's asking if in those 10 states or other states that eventually pass this as a law, does it bind future governors and state houses? And the answer is yes, because it's a law, but they could vote to like uh, change the law. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. But uh, they're on board. Uh, I think they're going to stay on board. So yes, you had a question. How much of a chance, and is it realistic to expect our Republican houses to vote this thing? She's asking how realistic it is to expect the Republicans in the legislature to vote for this thing. And I haven't done a tally. I kind of suspect, uh, I mean, if you're reading the papers, you can see there are some Republicans who are just like this, you know, holding their nose and doing it anyway. And there's others who are just walking away and talking about creating a different party. And so I would say there's uh, some number of Republicans who would like to support this. Probably a majority in the legislature do not want to support it. But uh, I did notice the, when I looked up the information on the Republican Party in Durham that the chairman of the Republican Party is an African American. And that uh, there's a black Republican caucus. And so that's one of the reasons I'm making, sharing the information that this is a white supremacy tool and has had a huge, horrible impact specifically on black people. And hopefully black folks and others in the Republican Party and the Libertarian Party will hear that and go like, yeah, this is just like so beyond the pale. You know, we are the only democracy doing this. Uh, even American states don't do this. Basically what got it in place 
was that uh, it was kind of a coalition, an imperfect coalition of the small states, of the original 13 colonies, who wanted some power, and the slave states. And so they had the larger free states over a barrel, basically saying, if you want us to be one country, we need, as the small states and the slave states, we want our thumbs on the scale of who becomes president. And that paid for, off for them in 1800. Uh, and perhaps in other elections, um, uh, I learned about the 1800 election, Gary Willis, who's a historian, used to be a conservative, now he's a liberal, so he wrote about it extensively. And, uh, but there may have been other elections in that period where the same thing happened, but for like the first six elections, they did not keep a tally of uh, actual votes of citizens. Believe it, they just really left it up to the Electoral College to decide, and they recorded that. So other questions, yes, sir? Right, yes. When did that change in the history? Because it, it seems like that would be a check of, check of balance, right? Your top two vote yeah, it was either the 1796 election it changed or the 1800 election it changed. Well, it wasn't the 1800 because I think Jefferson was the vice president for Adams in 1800. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I, I, all I would do, he's asking, you know, what year in, like when George Washington was president and John Adams, the way it was, the, you didn't select your vice president to go with your president, it was just whoever came in second became vice president, and it changed around 1800, 1804. I don't, I don't recall the details. My recommendation, uh, go home, open up your internet machine, <laughs> ask Dr. Google. Dr. Google seems to know a lot of things, and some of the things turn out to be true, and then you can ask Dr. Google for sites that will tell you which sites have true things, but then you need to check out those sites, so it can be, you have to take your chances. But other questions? So I've... Victoria, thank you. I was hoping. Victoria. Tell me. Victoria. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sandra. Oh, no. Sorry. Come on. Victoria, right, right. Right. Huh. I want to piggyback on the lady over here. Was she saying earlier about yes. Victoria College? If you're going to, and I hope it's successful because I trust your judgment, um, if you're going to try to dilute if that's the right word, the Electoral College, with the midterm election coming up, mm -hmm. and the sentiment of our elected officials present, mm -hmm. whether they're filling in or not, are uh, probably going to run again. Yeah, right. Where does that put us, if, the, if I understand you correctly, in trying to dilute the Electoral College and the strength of our vote? How do you have a balance with it? And, and the strength of North Carolina's vote? Right. Uh, so her question, if I've got you right, is that um, if we do this change, how does it affect North Carolina's role in electing the and president? And our vote. And our vote. Right. It's, uh, I understand what she said correctly. The strength of the vote, right. were you saying that the strength of the vote would be diluted or? Well, it is diluted now. Yeah, yeah it's right. the Electoral right. College. No, right. we eliminated the Electoral College. Your vote would be as good as anybody else's vote anywhere in the country. Right. right. It's the Electoral College that provides the dilution. Mm -hmm. So your vote is worth less than the votes of people in smaller states. Mm -hmm. And North Carolina is the yeah. ninth or tenth largest state in population. So there's like 40 states smaller than us, and any of their voters have more influence on who becomes president than any of us does, okay. right? And so what would happen, and so the second part of your question, how that would affect us in 2020, mm -hmm. right now, North Carolina gets a lot of attention because we're kind of a split 50-50 purple state. Right. So we do get candidates coming, and I think that'll still be the case, right. even if we're successful in this. And hopefully, in terms of going back to the timeline question, if, if we get a lot of uh, momentum this spring, and enough of the uh, legislators who get elected in November of 2018 are like, yeah, we need to do this. They can put it in play, and if enough of other states do it, we may be able to unplug, which is how I think of it, unplug the Electoral College before 2020. Okay. And if we don't unplug it before 2020, um, which, which 2018 isn't our only chance to get this change, right? right? right. 
because then in 2020, there's another, all the other, all the state house and state senate people come up again, and we can go put more, more people be educated, more pressure, more organizations will have signed on, right? So it do, it's not like a do or die. It's just like two years and two years and two years. And so in 2020, if we don't get rid of it, the person who comes in second again could be our president because their campaign may use the jerry-rigging computer programs to figure out where to campaign best, which is what Trump wants us to think. I think it was just an accident. It was just bad luck that favored him on how people turn out, and also some voter suppression in Wisconsin. You know, Jim Crow 2.0 brought to us by the Supreme Court justices appointed by George Bush, who was brought to us by the Electoral College. Do you see how this is just like this cascading problem? And so, uh, so if, if, if we don't get rid of this thing by 2020, we could have, you know, Trump could win again if he decides to run again. If he doesn't run again, I'm not going to pin my hopes on his impeachment. I'm not confident about that happening. But he may not want to run again because he could just go home and make more money. Mike Pence could run and win because of the Electoral College in 2020. Nikki Haley could run and come in second place and become our president. So that's kind of what we're facing. And that's kind of the timeline. And I appreciate y'all's time and attention. And was that helpful?